You may also be aware that one of the Acton Institute's core principles is the importance of the rule of law and the subsidiary role of government. And naturally, upholding the rule of law presupposes a sound judicial system. So I'm delighted that today's speaker is a distinguished expert on judicial issues and the constitutional limits to the state. Today's format follows an approach similar to our Engage the Speaker sessions, which we held last month at Acton University Online. We will begin with a lecture from our speaker, and that will be followed by a live question and answer session. Questions can be submitted as a comment on Facebook Live or may also be sent by email to digital at acton.org. So without further ado, let me introduce to you today's speaker. Carrie Severino is president of the Judicial Crisis Network, a network dedicated to promoting the U.S. Constitution's vision of limited government and the rule of law, as well as the importance of an impartial and fair judiciary. In addition to being an expert on the judicial confirmation process, Ms. Severino writes and speaks on an array of judicial topics ranging from the Constitution's limits on government power to federal and state judicial selection processes. Her expertise is highly sought by major media outlets such as CNN, Fox, MSNBC, C-SPAN, and ABC's This Week. Additionally, her insights into the confirmation process of Justice Brett Kavanaugh yielded over 100 televised appearances and culminated in her best-selling book, Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Court, which was co-authored by Molly Hemingway. In addition to clerking for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and Judge David Sentel of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit, Kerry regularly files briefs for Supreme Court cases. She received her Bachelor of Arts in Biology from Duke University, a Master of Arts in Linguistics from Michigan State University, and a Juris Doctor degree from Harvard Law School. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Carrie Severino. So then let us now turn to Carrie's lecture, after which we will open it up for questions and answers. Hi, it's great to be here at the Acton Institute. I had hoped to be speaking to you from my hometown of Grand Rapids in April, um, but obviously uh, COVID-19 intervened and here we are um, coming from my home in Virginia now in July. It seems like so many things are a world away at this point of uh, you know what we were looking at back then or thought we would be seeing and, and where things are now. But I think the themes um, of the lessons that we've learned from the Kavanaugh confirmation and some of the concerns about what our country is facing going forward are even more crucial at this point uh, than maybe they were as I was preparing uh, to give this talk in April. Um, you know, one of the big the big themes of this confirmation, and, and from it I get the name of the book that Molly and Heming Hemingway and I wrote on, on uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation, Justice on Trial. The notion of due process, the notion of having a consistent standard that applies to all parties that come to a court, not just, uh, not just the people you like uh, or the people you dislike, but to, to apply that across the board. That's not just something that we hold in the Constitution. It's not something that's simply for the legal system. It's a value for in our society and in Western culture that I, unfortunately I think we have lost uh, sight of in many ways and, and the Kavanaugh confirmation is just one data point illustrating that. The notion of the presumption of innocence was really uh, thrown out uh, as well in that context, another important foundational value. And then um, an another motivating factor um, that, that went into my studying this confirmation. I was someone who worked on the confirmation um, out from the outside, advocating for Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation uh, on TV and radio uh, during the process. Molly, my, my co-author, is someone who had written about it. Uh, but we also were motivated because we knew that if, you, if, if we forget our history, obviously we are condemned to repeat it, right? And also, if we fail to tell the history, it is, it, it's almost worse. We are, we are likely to have someone else retell the history in a way that may not be accurate. Uh, I, I clerked on the Supreme Court uh, now almost uh, you know 15 years ago uh, for Justice Thomas. And I remember with his confirmation process, what we saw was very similar to Justice Kavanaugh's, strikingly so, 
but also a, a process that didn't end with his confirmation. After this heated battle, after America, much like with the Kavanaugh confirmation, was glued to their screens, everyone was watching this, everyone uh, you know, taking in every detail of these shocking last minute allegations of the justices' response to them. Um, it, when, when people were polled immediately at the time of his confirmation in 1991, two to one Americans said they believed Justice Thomas over Anita Hill. And that held across race, black and white, the same thing, men and women, same thing. So people who had lived through it had one view of this. But if you took those polls today, I think you'd see something very different because we've lived through decades of a, a campaign of, of sorts in the media, in, in everywhere from HBO writing a story about it to the way it's taught, taught in high schools, uh, to the way it's addressed in law schools, uh, it's it's become a revisionist history of the actual story of the Thomas confirmation. Um, as as someone who loves and respects uh, justice and admires Justice Thomas very much, as one of my major legal mentors, I thought, well, if I can do for someone else what I wasn't there to do for him, that is to write the story, tell it correctly, and make sure that people aren't able to uh, rewrite this history, then that is that is a great service. I can do. And so that's also some of them that motivated us in learning about the Kavanaugh confirmation. We researched this thoroughly and talked to more than 100 different individuals involved, from the president and the vice president to senators, to uh, members of the Supreme Court, to people who knew the Blasey family and the, and the uh, Kavanaugh family, uh, trying to tell the fullest possible picture in the hopes that that will uh, then stave off some of the the false histories being written. And then also to learn what lessons we, we can. It was such a trying period for the country to go through, obviously for the Kavanaugh family to go through, um, but for, I think for the nation as a whole, um, that we, sh we owe it to ourselves to learn the lessons from this so we, we do not have to repeat them <laughs> and, and, and learn lessons the more painful way again. So that, that um, revisionist history, in fact, already started shortly after our book came out last July. Um, already in September, there was a book that was writing about the Kavanaugh, uh, his, his upbringing really purported to uh, bring out some new allegations. Uh, providentially, Molly and I were able to get a hold of an early copy of this book, which when we read it, realized, we realized that this allegation, they were trumpeting as a, uh, hey, this is new allegation that had been covered up, trying to use that as a hook to sell their book, was in fact uh, completely uh, unfounded. In fact, even the woman who was alleged to have been involved herself said she doesn't remember anything like that happening. So it is the thinnest read on which to attempt to continue a smear campaign uh, into a, this, its second year, right, against a sitting Supreme Court justice. Um, and yet this is the kind of material we were working with. And there were then subsequent books that came out, uh, many of which uh, had similar similar attempts from people within, uh, that, within the establishment that had been working against Justice Kavanaugh trying to reignite the controversy. One very telling thing for us was to realize that with an additional year of investigation, which of course at the time of the confirmation was what everyone said they needed. We need to delay this vote so that we understand and have time to dig into some of these allegations. There's just too many open questions. Well, now we've had several different journalists and different groups had an opportunity to spend a whole year looking into those things with, with extensive access to those who are making these allegations to people who knew uh, all of the individuals involved. And we saw that no, no new information actually was available. We still are at the point we were at the end of uh, 2018, which was that we have these allegations that are un that are uncorroborated. Uh, we still have no evidence that Christine Blasey Ford, in fact, even met uh, Brett Kavanaugh, let alone that her alleged uh, the, this alleged assault uh, that she describes took place. Uh, I think there's even more questions raised about uh, Deborah Ramirez. In fact, some of them were brought up by the subsequent books where it, it now has become clear that initially when she was talking to reporters, even she did not think it was Brett Kavanaugh who had exposed himself to her at that party in her freshman year in Yale. So, uh, and later her story developed into what it was. That, I thought that was a shocking revelation that would have been a better hook to sell these, uh, these anti-Kavanaugh books, but it didn't fit the narrative they were going for. And of course, um, the Michael Avenatti, Julie Swetnick claims that frankly, were, were discredited almost as soon as they were um, put out there, but not, bef not before there was a chance for the media and Democrats to really uh, treat them as a it's shocking and new development. Now Kavanaugh's part of a, a serial gang rape uh, cartel in, in the suburbs of, of Maryland. Um, that 
though their their allegations i think have been thoroughly debunked in fact they've even been referred to the department of justice for criminal investigation so i think that's uh, you know we we've, we've seen that this year has not added credibility to the the claims there um looking at some of the themes of what we have learned from this confirmation process one of the uh the things that molly and i discovered as we were as we were doing these interviews was the importance of knowing your history and when you it, you know understanding how we got here why are we in a situation where supreme court nominations are one of the hottest political events of certainly of 2018 even with an election going on that was one of the one of the biggest things that happened why are we in this situation when you look at the progress of where the courts have been in america you can kind of see how that happened in historically through much of the 20th century, the courts were very much dominated by a liberal wing whose philosophy and approach to the reading the law wasn't that which uh, that that I would advocate, where you're looking at the text first, you're looking at the original understanding of it, um, but really one that that looked first to results and first said, well, what do we think is the just result? What do we think? Where do we want this to go? And then found a legal justification after the fact, almost. Um, and what was what's even more surprising, I think, for people nowadays, where you think of court nominations being a major issue for a Republican base is that m the vast majority of the really liberal justices were actually appointed by Republican presidents. You think of people like Justice Earl Warren, Chief Justice Earl Warren, one of the most uh, liberal justices in his court is sort of notorious for having a, a series of uh, aggressively uh, liberal results. He was nominated by President Eisenhower and not because Eisenhower admired or necessarily even knew about what his judicial philosophy would be. That's not what he was. The, it wasn't the inquiry. The inquiry was, well, he, he had been in a primary for president and Earl Warren was also a Republican. He had, he had been the governor of California. He was running for president. And he stepped down um, out, out of the the uh, the primary race and allowed uh, Eisenhower to kind of move through and take uh, California. Eisenhower thought, well, one political turn deserves another and made him chief justice of the Supreme Court. So, you know, and, and the result of that is, you know, is decades long of decisions uh, that have a, a really profound effect on American law. Uh, you think of people like Harry Blackman, who was the author of Roe versus Wade, he was a Nixon appointee. This isn't, you know, this isn't something where you have Republican nominees who look particularly different from the other nominees in the court. One of the most leading uh, liberal uh, justices on the court for much of the, you know, 80s, 90s, and in, in, into the, the 2000s was Justice John Paul Stevens. He was Gerald Ford's nominee to the court. So this just illustrates you know the the challenges that were that were there um, in terms of the fact that the court had really been completely co-opted by a group of of liberals who were when they couldn't achieve their goals in the elected branches of government, which is of course how our constitution imagines these things happening, that the that our laws are made by our our elected legislators, they would turn to the courts and were very successful in achieving lots of um, their goals there you know from abortion to eliminating prayer in schools to expanding the size of government to uh to developments in criminal law that made it much more pro-criminal um for temporarily stopping the death penalty altogether uh, you know a lot of different areas uh, where that that became the norm in american law that um stopped or began to stop i should say with the president reagan who himself as governor of, of California had experienced the challenges of trying to have his, his conservative policy agenda constantly stymied by liberal justices in his court. So he came into the White House knowing the significance of that, and that really affected the way he chose his judges. This is how we get people like Justice Scalia. It was also how we got nominees like Judge Bork, who, which was another major shift in this process, where suddenly the left saw, okay, there's, there's some success now pushing back on what had been a complete hegemony of the courts. And uh, they had won the Senate, which is I think another key factor that people forget in these confirmation battles and played a huge role in the Kavanaugh battle as well, the significance of every vote in the Senate and how that, um, that process of confirmation uh, affects what a president can do in terms of nominating and who we get on the, on the court. Well, Bork, now with the Democratic Senate, they realized we had the possibility of stopping him. And they uh, took out a a um, method of that, that had actually been practiced once against a previous uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist, but the idea of starting out and framing him initially 
with the uh, Robert Bork America speech. And then moving on, there were, there were literally hundreds of liberal organizations spending incredible sums of money um, running TV ads, which was the first time in American history that kind of thing had happened. The famous ads with Gregory Peck talking about the dangers of, of America if, if Robert Bork were confirmed to the Supreme Court. And with these hyperbolic statements that were really misconstructions of his own record and very unfair uh, characterizations of his positions he had taken both on the, uh, as, a, as a judge in the DC Circuit and as a law professor. Um, we, the, that was something that took the conservative world very much, you know, they, were, they were so surprised to see this, they almost didn't know how to respond to it, down to the fact that the, the judge's own son, when he was defending his father on television, his father said, stand down, I don't want you going on TV talking about my record and correcting the record, um, that's just not becoming. The Reagan White House that was offered by people like Charlton Heston. Hey, I'll do a I'll do a competing TV ad. We're I'm, we're happy to go, you know, Hollywood star against Hollywood star and see, you know, just so the American people see this other side. And the Reagan White House said, no, that's not the direction we want to go. Now, one of the things we've learned is you you do have to recognize that we, we are in an era where Supreme Court confirmations have turned into a major political battle as well. This isn't just simply uh, the Marquess of Queensbury rules. We're, we're really fighting a real battle here. And it's, it's something that Justice Scalia predicted was going to continue to be a problem. He said when justices act like politicians, we shouldn't be surprised that their selection process has turned into a political process, which is exactly what has happened. Um, so we see this being a major political battle because when because that the court is the arena that so many of those political battles that should have been fought in the elected branches, in who we get put in the Congress, who, who we put in the White House. Um, when the court took those roles over, which is not really their constitutional role to be writing laws or editing those laws, right? Um, then suddenly the politics got brought into the court as well. So now we have to recognize these battles are going to be political. Uh, we, we come ready with it with people, not just uh, who are understanding on the inside, okay, we have to be defensive, we have to acknowledge, especially, for example, after the Thomas confirmation, knowing that any, at any point um, unfounded allegations could come up and we have to be ready to deal with them, um, but also having organizations ready to, to uh, go to the airwaves, go and, and, and talk about the importance of the court and having justices who are committed to the rule of law and not to just uh, a political outcome in cases and reading their politics into the law, um, we need to have those people ready to go. Uh, so that was really key. Another area that we've learned from that history is the importance of having alternative media. Uh, there was a great quote exchange after conf uh, the confirmation of Kavanaugh between Christopher Scalia, who's Justice Scalia's youngest son, and uh, Robert Bork Jr. Christopher Scalia said, um, after, you know, he's, he was, he, name checked a bunch of different conservative media outlets, National Review and Fox News and uh, you know the Federalist went down a whole list and he said, you know, thank you and and can you imagine what this confirmation would have liked but looked like if these groups didn't exist. And Robert Bork Jr. responded, yes, yes I can. And that, you know, that shift in having an alternate means to even get out important information was crucial in having the, the Kavanaugh confirmation be a successful one. Um, and I think is something we have to continue to value, particularly now as there's just a real battle within, um, within the press about whether, you, whether to even have a, um, a superficial attempt at neutrality. I think many, many press outlets are, are almost abandoning that, that effort even in, the, in, in a political cleansing of their editorial boards down to their even, even their journalism. Um, and it's very disturbing, but it, it's, it brings home the importance of having that alternative media. Another major theme that we found through uh, looking at people in, in the, the personalities involved in this confirmation is the importance of courage. And again, this is only more important, I think, today in the, in the increasing cancel culture that we live in. We saw people like Susan Collins, who was a, is a moderate Republican, pro-choice. She's, uh, she's not, you know, the, she's not Ted Cruz. <laughs> she's not, far, not, not to the right, um, but she was a key vote uh, for Kavanaugh, uh, partly because that he had no room for error, and I mentioned the significance of the Senate. We talked to a lot of outside organizations, you know, pro-life groups or uh, you know just conservative organizations who uh, who were involved in this nomination, and, and several of them said we started working on this nomination in 2014. And you go 2014? That's like 
way before Trump was even elected. And they said, we knew we needed to have, have senators in place who'd be willing to vote for, for um, conservative and principled judicial picks um, before we would even be able to have this discussion. I thought that was really insightful. That battle was what brought us to the point where there even was a, uh, a Republican-controlled Senate for uh, the Kavanaugh confirmation. And frankly, it was only barely Republican-controlled. Recall that at the beginning of this, um, John McCain was was in the hospital or, or certainly not, not well. He was not able to come back to D.C. for votes. So even though the Republicans held the slimmest of majorities, they didn't even have one of their votes available um, at the time. And then it, it ended up really turning on Susan Collins, and everyone knew this was going to be a key. She and Lisa Murkowski were very much in the uh, crosshairs of the left. Uh, she, her office was receiving uh, threats and uh, intimidation from the very day Kennedy retired. They immediately started receiving coat hangers sent to their office as a veiled threat about abortion. She had a rice, a false, thank goodness, rice and uh, threat called into her house. Her, her husband, down to her, her, their puppy, had to be quarantined. They had the weapons of mass destruction team out there. She was threatened by her neighbors. She was threatened by str a strange man who claimed he was from CNN in front of her house. I mean, it was, it was a really um, challenging time. But in the midst of all that, she and, and, and even knowing that her political future was very much tied into this because there were people raising money already against her 2020 opponent, not even knowing who that person would be, but saying, we'll pledge to donate money to her opponent if, you, uh, if she votes for Kavanaugh. So knowing how important this was, instead of simply licking her finger and putting it to the wind and saying, which way should I go for my political future? She, she dug down and said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this the, the best, well, most well-researched decision I can. She hired lawyers, she herself is not a lawyer, hired lawyers to help her read through his record. She knew it cold. She had one discussion with a lawyer who was saying, well, what do you, what do you think about his record on this? I mean, it's, don't you think it's bad? And she'd go, oh, wait, you forgot footnote three in, her, in, in that, in that uh, speech he gave because that actually really clarifies what he meant there. So she knew it down to the footnotes. It was incredible. And she was willing uh, at a time when many people were abandoning reason and abandoning their... Um, their, their rational approach to things in the passion of the moment. She stood on the Senate floor and gave what I thought will always be remembered as one of the most impressive uh, examples of statesmanship. It was, uh, we, we titled our chapter on her, Mrs. Smith, or Mrs. Collins Goes to Washington, because it's just like Mr. Smith goes to Washington in many ways and the inspiration that you get from focusing on the actual evidence, the due process, et cetera. Um, they were, it was a time that was very challenging for people to stand up. When you look at the people who were in this Maryland community that knew uh, Blasey's, the Blasey's that knew the Kavanaugh's, we had a lot of people who came to us, and I know who spoke to the Judiciary Committee or the White House at the time, who knew a lot of information that cast some of those allegations very much into doubt and were unwilling to stand up in, in, in many cases because they were concerned about the repercussions that they would face. In 2020, those kind of concerns are even more serious, right? We see the challenge that people have standing up to an angry mob, and I think it reminds us how important that is to be willing to do that. If we don't have people who are willing to stand up, then those who are telling false stories will simply succeed by default. Uh, one of the best examples of courage, who did against all, the, all of her um, instincts and all of her incentives stand up, was Leland Kaiser. She was a good friend of, of Christine Blasey Ford's. She was the one woman who was alleged to have been at this party. She's a lifelong Democrat, did not want to see Kavanaugh confirmed. But when she was indicated that she was at that party, she she thought, oh, wow, I, would, I need to support my friend, but I can't remember anything. So she went and tried to, did a, did a bunch of looking at pictures and yearbooks, tried to ask people about, okay, how can I how, dredge up some memories? Because I, I, want, I want to be able to help Chrissy couldn't do so and put out a statement to that effect. That triggered a major campaign against her by their, their common friends. People were, were, were threatening her, saying, well, she must have committed perjury because she must have known him. And so they're threatening her with, with potential legal repercussions. They were threatening to reveal uh, uh, bad aspects of her past, her, her struggles with, uh, with uh, abuse of different substances, and uh, saying, well, we're going to go public with this to discredit you. It was a very difficult time. It meant her um, alienating good friends, but she, and even though it went, went against her political interest, she stood up. She told the FBI not only that she didn't uh, have any memory of, of uh, Ford's uh, allegations, but also that she, uh, that she had been pressured 
by many people to change this. And her testimony was something that many senators uh, suggested was really a major factor in their decision to um, to vote to, to confirm Kavanaugh. It gave them added confidence that this is something they could believe. Later, um, she even has, has said that she disbelieves uh, Ford at this point. The more she's gone back and thought about it, the more she realized it didn't even add up and didn't didn't line up with what she remembered of that summer and the types of parties that she would have gone to. So uh, that took an incredible amount of courage. Another woman I, I loved in this story is Lisa Blatt. She is an incredibly accomplished uh, advocate, a Supreme Court lawyer. She has argued before the Supreme Court more than any woman in history and has an almost 100% success rate. It's incredible. She's very liberal, but she stood up for uh, Justice Kavanaugh. She introduced him at the Senate and spoke in, in his Senate he hearing. She did not abandon him when things got crazy during the, uh, the, the Ford allegations and uh, as a result was even forced out of her law firm, despite the fact that she personally is very liberal. Um, but I was so impressed talking to her because she had an approach of saying, look, I'm not a victim for, I, I, of, of being you know forced out of these things. I have a great job. I'm doing fine. And uh, if people don't want to be my friend anymore, or don't want to work with me anymore, it's their loss. If, if more people had that approach, we wouldn't have to worry as much about the courage of the American population in standing up to mobs today. So I really admire her for that. Another um, amazing story that we learned, it was the role of faith in this. Um, Ashley Kavanaugh herself is a woman of great faith, and many people around her talked about her influence on them and how she, who is much closer to the center of this, of course, uh, was a, a voice of support and prayer for them through this difficult time. Uh, it was also fascinating to learn some of the corollaries between uh, Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation and Justice Thomas in terms of faith. We learned that Ashley Kavanaugh, when she was looking, uh, when, when her husband was being looked at for the Supreme Court, so before he'd even been nominated, was praying the Lord's Prayer from Gethsemane, Lord, let this cut pass for me. That was the same prayer, of course, that Justice Thomas was praying as he's going into his final trial, really, during his, um, his confirmation hearings. We also learned that a passage that was significant to Justice Kavanaugh because as a lector at his church, he had been asked to read this uh, the Sunday at Mass the Sunday before he was nominated. At that point, he thought he wasn't going to get the nomination, uh, which, was, which was a disappointment to him. That seemed to be the direction the news was going. Um, and he read the passage, and it was, it's uh, a passage from uh, Corinthians. And it's, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. And it continues with, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and constraints for the sake of Christ. For when I'm weak, then I'm strong. And when he read that, he sort of felt like this is a, you know, this is really significant because this is something that I, I, I had wanted and I worked for it. I'm not going to get this and, and God will get me through this. Um, he, pays, he emailed that to his, his clerks and, and said, wow, this is really significant. Well, right after that mass, he was, he was picked up immediately from the church, in fact, by the Secret Service, brought to the White House and learned that he was, in fact, going to be nominated. Um, and then later in his process, when everything exploded, um, that passage came back as a reminder of, oh, wow, this is God that has to get get me through this. Um, that's also one of the same passages that Justice Thomas was praying through. You know, those two were the ones he mentions in his autobiography as, as things that helped him through his own confirmation process. Really amazing uh, stories of faith. Um, a final issue that, that is a real concern um, that came up and I think is unfortunately only more prevalent today is intimidation. There was a real, the, the whole process of having this kind of attack on a Supreme Court justice, I think is a form of intimidation against the court, against those who might be nominated in the future, against presidents who might be willing to nominate, make bold nominations of principled men and women to these positions, and um, against those justices themselves who, although they, once you're on, you get a life tenure, you know that you that your you know, the, the people who are going to be talking about you for generations, like with Justice Thomas, they're going to be willing to continue hammering on, away at this, uh, these themes for the rest of your, of your tenure on the court. And is that the legacy you want to, you want to leave? That's, that's kind of the threats that people are going to um, make that, that forever, and this is something that Christine Blasey Ford's own lawyer even said was a motivation for her and for Ford, that, that they wanted to put an asterisk next to Kavanaugh's name. Uh, so that any they, their thoughts in any case that he would uh, rule against abortion in particular, they wanted to have an asterisk so that he would uh, it would discredit his decision. That's the intimidation going on. We've seen in increasing uh, amounts of that 
with uh, Senator Whitehouse, one of the Judiciary Committee members, famous for bringing the word boofing into the national public vocabulary and, and dr drilling us all on the, the ins and outs of Kavanaugh's uh, high school yearbook page. But, um, but he's also now famous for filing one of the most hostile su uh, Supreme Court briefs in history. It's an amicus brief in a gun case in which he and several of his, his Democratic colleagues basically threatened the court if it didn't rule in their way. Um, which was to dismiss the court, the case as moot, um, then they would potentially have to pack the court. There's a t talk of let's well, you know, if we can win the House and the Senate and the White House, we'll just add members to the court, so we'll have a majority on the court again. Uh, this would of course trigger a cycle uh, of of spiraling, you know, numbers and things. The court would be horrible for the institution, and and many saw this as a mafiosi like threat to the Chief Justice in particular. We're going to destroy your institution here if uh, you don't rule the way we did. As it happens, they did in fact rule that way, and Justice Alito's dissent in that case suggests that he thinks maybe maybe the intimidation uh, got under the collars of some of the the justices on the court. Uh, Senator Chuck Schumer had a another shocking um, outcry at the court uh, last spring with, when they were having arguments on an, an abortion case. It, he he was shouting and pointing at the court. I'm I'm telling you, J Justice Gorsuch, I, I'm I'm going to tell you, Justice Kavanaugh. You've sowed the wind. You're going to reap the whirlwind. You don't know what hit you, if you rule against us in this in this case. And uh, that's the kind of threat that I think is really shocking to see to the court. And unfortunately, if those uh, people making those threats, you know, if they, if they seem to be successful, which unfortunately, uh, I think a lot of people have read those as having worked against the court. I think that's a real problem. I think another area that we that is of concern to me is seeing that some of the other. Um, uh, you know, people I mentioned, Julie Swetnick and, and Michael Avenatti, there were two others even who were referred to the Department of Justice for investigation because of filing false claims and, 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 and alleging uh, behavior against Kavanaugh that they actually was false. And that's it's demonstrably so. Um, those, there has been no follow-up from the Department of Justice. There's been no charges brought. So there appears to be no accountability. Going forward, what does that mean for the next nomination? Uh, the, those just those senators who like Senator Feinstein who who concealed these allegations until the last minute Senator Booker who was releasing confidential information from the committee uh, there have been no consequences for them and unfortunately if this appears to be if these intimidation tactics and, and underhanded methods appear to be winning the day then there's no there's no reason to think they're not going to win going forward um, so you know in in looking forward now. Is this really worth a fight? We've established this is an incredible, um, you know, endeavor getting a Supreme Court justice confirmed. And if you want to get someone confirmed who actually has a clear record of originalism and textualism, it means it's going to be a knockdown, dragout fight that will have major repercussions for them, for their family, for the nation. Right? Um, I would say yes, it is worth the fight. I think I think as I mentioned earlier, we're having this fight because the conservative legal movement has been so successful. Um, in its efforts to shift the debate, now instead of looking now now instead of looking first at just what is what do, what do the judges think is right, how do I make a policy argument effectively at the court, any court that you're going to in the country from the Supreme Court down, you do have to start with the text. You have to start with looking at what the law actually is and means. You have to make a serious attempt to look at the original understanding. It has resulted in major wins in the area of Second Amendment rights, limits on government, separation of powers. Um, the ability to regulate abortion uh, by states for women's health. Uh, in, in particular, this term, we saw a, a trio of amazing decisions on religious liberty capping off a decade of solid wins for a court that I think is more protective of religious liberty than any court we have seen in American history. We now have a new generation of really outstanding appellate judges that, that Trump has put in the court, in part because, as we uh, learned with the Kavanaugh nomination and, and on, he has been trying to vet people for courage. They're going to need that courage not just to get through the confirmation process, but also you need men and women who have shown in their careers they're willing to stand up for unpopular causes that they know are right, stand up for a, a correct legal result, even though they know they're going to get political or other pushback. Um, and these are now the new leaders on the appellate bench. These are the men and women who are going to be probably on his next Supreme Court list, probably being looked at for future vacancies. That's incredibly optimistic. Um, I also worry, though, because we know they're going to fight a huge battle. I talked to one uh, insider who said no one, probably no one of these people would want to even be considered for the Supreme Court, except that they're all so naive they think it's never going to happen to me. Um, and uh, But unfortunately, we do know 
that it, it can happen and it did happen. It just happened. So now the only question going forward is whether we are going to let this happen again. Thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Well, greetings to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, and especially thank you to Carrie Severino for joining us today. Uh, just for those who may have uh, logged on recently, I'd like to recap by giving an uh, introduction of who Carrie is and her background. So Carrie Severino is the president of the Judicial Crisis Network, a network dedicated to promoting the U.S. Constitution's vision of limited government and the rule of law, and the importance of a fair and impartial judiciary. In addition to being an expert on the judicial confirmation process, Mrs. Severino writes and speaks on an array of judicial topics ranging from the Constitution's limits on government power to state and federal judicial selection processes. Her expertise is highly sought by major media outlets where she has been interviewed by MSNBC, Fox, CNN, C-SPAN, and ABC's This Week. Additionally, her insights into the confirmation process of Justice Brett Kavanaugh yielded over 100 televised appearances and culminated in her best-selling book, Justice on Trial, The Kavanaugh Confirmation and the Future of the Court, which she co-authored with Molly Hemingway. In addition to clerking for Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas and Judge David Sentel of the U.S. Court of Appeals, Severino has regularly filed briefs for the Supreme Court cases. She received a Bachelor of Arts degree in biology from Duke University, a Master of Arts in Linguistics from Michigan State, and her Juris Doctor degree from Harvard Law School. So welcome and thank you so much, Carrie. I understand you were supposed to be joining us back in April, but then all sorts of things happened as we know. And so we appreciate your flexibility. Glad to be here under whatever circumstances, so. Yes, yes, so so good. You know, your book is fascinating. Your, your lecture was terrific. It's a topic that's of great interest to me. And, and I just remember going through and observing some of the things that had happened during uh, uh, Justice Kavanaugh's confirmation process, but I'm not an expert in that process. And so I'm wondering, you know, for my sake and for the sake of our listeners, if, if you were to describe sort of the, the ideal process, the way it should go, both from a, a vetting uh, by the executive branch as well as then a confirmation uh, uh, by the Senate, what would that look like? Well, it's a process that frankly uh, didn't start with the vacancy. It's been hit something that is constantly ongoing, uh, particularly you know now that Trump has came into office, uh, having run on this list of, of potential Supreme Court nominees, but uh, we learned that this is something that the, the White House Counsel's Office was constantly keeping tabs on, watching some of the people that were on that list, watching some of the other judges who they thought maybe would be worth adding to the list. And in fact, Kavanaugh is one of the people who was added to that list after the president's election, after Gorsuch had been confirmed in, in November of 2017, he was added. So that's something that the White House is actually in the process of doing again right now, looking through, uh, and in this case, it's going to be probably a lot of new Trump nominees to the appellate courts who are going to be the next generation that maybe needs to be on that list. There's some really outstanding men and women uh, who Trump has nominated who are just excel in not just their legal acumen. And these are the kind of things you're looking for. You're looking at their, their ability to, uh, obviously, they just have to have the, the, the chops to do it. They have to be smart. They have to understand how to make these arguments. Uh, but you also want someone who has a appropriate legal philosophy and their judicial philosophy, not someone who believes that, well, you know, the Constitution can be sort of updated with what we think, where we think things are going, uh, the direction of the future. That's that's kind of an anti-democratic approach to the courts. It's not, not a, a principled way to look at it. So you need someone who both understands and can articulate that view, but also has demonstrated that in their career. So it, it's not enough to just say, oh yes, I'm an originalist, but you have to show that in uh, ideally in experience on the bench. So right now the, the White House and, and groups like ours are looking through the records of all of these new judges saying, okay, what are all the decisions they're going to? You can't just look at what is the result. Like, oh good, I like the result, check. It's, you have to actually look at the reasoning. How are they getting there? Did they understand how to interpret a statute faithfully? Do they understand how to interpret the constitution faithfully? And then finally, and this is something that really is unique to the Trump administration, and I think is something we've learned from previous confirmations, uh, is that you need to find someone who has a, a proven record also of courage. So not just track record on the legal, you know, knowing how to do the legal questions, but standing up for for um, 
issues that they believe are important, standing up for what they know is a correct legal result, even though they know they're going to get pushed back. So for example, some of these people on the appellate courts that exemplify that for uh, Kyle Duncan always comes to mind for me. He was used to work at Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. He was leading the team that won the Hobby Lobby decision. He also was Solicitor General in his state of Louisiana, uh, helping to defend the state's marriage laws, helping to stand, defend states that the law had uh, in, in imposing some regulations on abortions and health standards, et cetera, on, on abortions in the states. Those are things that used to get you immediately off of any potential list for, for further advancement because people would go, oh, wow. too hard to handle. Nowadays, that's the kind of thing that gets you on because they say, hey, this guy took those choices knowing that was the right thing to do, even when he thought it could have negative consequences for him. That's the kind of person we want to see who's going to be when they're on the court that isn't going to continue in that defensive crouch and just say, oh, I don't want to make any decision that's going to raise anyone's hackles, but is going to be, continue to be bold. And that I think you could you could tell, retell that story about so many of the the young judges that are on the courts now. Yes, yeah, that's you know it's interesting you bring up the courage and the fortitude, which seems to apply not simply to the judges, but also you mentioned several other cases, whether it be Senator Collins, um, or or other individuals who are called to testify uh, about a particular nominee, and uh, in 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 the case of Kavanaugh's process, there were individuals who uh, really had to step up and just stick with principle, and and it was kind of shocking to see the degree to which there's hostility, irrespective of the suffering that. Justice Kavanaugh had to go through, but there were others as well. Um, do you think that that's going to be a typical thing that, that others in society who may be called in as part of the process are going to have to be prepared for that kind of thing and have the same sort of courage? I think absolutely. And unfortunately, it's not new to the Kavanaugh confirmation. One of the things that Justice Thomas felt very deeply during his own was seeing people that he thought were his friends or would support him or even institutions, Yale Law School, frankly, in both of these men's cases, they both were alumni of the school and the school completely abandoned them uh, at, at this moment, refused to stand up for their their alumna, alumnus in either case. Um, I mean, that was really shocking. And, and you saw it with, with Justice Thomas, the NAACP uh, was convinced to oppose his nomination in order to give cover to a lot of other liberal groups who wanted to oppose him but felt they couldn't oppose a black nominee unless the NAACP went first. So it's things like that you realize who your friends really are in a situation like that. I think, unfortunately, this the way that cancel culture is going, we're getting to a chance to see that writ right. large in society in general. Uh, and you and there's, you know, I, I just think of the recent um, resignation of Barry Weiss from the, the New York Times. Yes. She was a, an editor there. And she I don't think she was particularly conservative, but she didn't she had some idiosyncratic views with respect to to um, the New York Times and talked about how people would praise her from behind the scenes is, oh, I, we really admire your courage for standing up, but then they wouldn't be willing to stand up to defend her when she was being attacked, sometimes very viciously. And that's that's the thing that's a, that's a real challenge. And I I, I love that, that I told about the story of Lisa Blatt. And I think the more people that are willing to stand up like her and say, whatever, you guys try to cancel me, I'm gonna just move forward. It makes it easier for everyone because then what, if, if that's the response, it's like a bully on the playground. If people are standing up, they'll move on. They realize they can't have the effect. So I think if we, if the more people that are willing to stand up and with, with the next nomination, I'm sure that that will be absolutely needed as well. And the more people that do that, it, it lowers the cost for everyone of standing up and it's, and it's just the right thing to do. Absolutely. And that gives individuals hope if they think that they could possibly be a candidate, they see that somebody does have the fortitude to stick out the process. And, and as you describe individuals who have the courage to stand by their principles, they will then not be intimidated to allow themselves to be a candidate. Otherwise, individuals might just say, forget it, it's just not worth it. And look what happened to so-and-so. So that is that is good to hear that there's at least some hopeful signs when individuals do behave in that way and stand up and, and, and have the courage. I do have some um, questions coming in from online, so I'd like to get to a few of them. Um, so the first one, uh, I, I'm going to read it here. It's a, it's a little bit long. So um, the question is, why do Republican presidents find it such a challenge to nominate reliable conservatives to the Supreme Court. Okay, so actually it looks like the rest is mostly a statement, so I'm gonna pause there. So why do they find it such a challenge to nominate reliable conservatives? Well, as I, as I talked about a little bit in my lecture, for a while it was because they weren't even trying, right? And then when they started trying and got the pushback, for example, with, with Judge Bork, I think it was because they, they, were, they were attempts to 
find these these people who were you know easy to get through the confirmation process and then and that's that way the attacks in the in the politicization of the confirmation process was a success for the liberals who were trying to use it to dissuade conservative nominees right. so you know i think if you were just drawing lawyers out of a hat you're you're going to almost overwhelmingly end up with liberal judges in the court. So that's part of the problem going forward, right? The sure. the legal profession is dominated, the legal academia is dominated by liberal thinking and that approach to the court. Uh, that is slowly shifting due to work by within the conservative legal movement, groups like the Federalist Society that has a great presence on campuses and, and starting to raise these, these issues more. But the bulk of lawyers are liberal. The sea in which in any judge is sort of swimming in is going to be one of those liberal ideas. The media is still, the elitist media is still dominated by liberal thought, maybe even more so and more explicitly so now than ever. Legal academia continues to have that as its dominant force. I, I uh, went to Harvard Law School when Elena Kagan was dean, and she was known for being a, just wonderfully open-minded and hiring all these conservatives. Do you know what that meant? That meant hiring three conservatives. That, that, <laughs> doubled the this, this number of conservatives on a campus that had almost, you know, 100 some faculty. So it, 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 yes, that's great, you know, well done, but she hired 10 times more liberals than she hired conservatives and it still left the campus 98% dominated by, by liberal professors. So you can see how, how, how difficult that is. I think it's also challenging because uh, you know, if, you, if you're trying to find people who, can, who are not going to raise any uh, red flags in a confirmation process, as for much of our history, people were, uh, Republican presidents were trying to do, you're gonna end up with people who either are constitutionally frightened of making these issues, or maybe in fact, aren't as conservative as they're being billed to be. That's certainly what we saw with David Souter. That may be what sure. we're seeing with Chief Justice uh, John Roberts. I think in that case, it seems more like a, a case of someone who for all his career was being so careful and so political about how he presented himself. And then that carries over onto the court. So I think that's why I think looking at courage is so important and significant because that's the, the approach that you need to see carry on to the court. If, we, if, we, if we're hiring someone who has a carefully cultivated image for that they've carried on for the first four or five decades of their life, we can't expect them to change um, to change their approach and suddenly be a bold leader <laughs> they, if they haven't done that in their life up until that point. Exactly. Well, interestingly, the person also then continued that question by asking why the Democrats don't seem to have as much of a challenge uh, you know, nominating those who are of like-minded with, uh, with their judicial philosophy. Do you suppose it is in part because of the reasons you've already cited that uh, a bigger pool to draw from as well as the processes in the media are allied toward those other perspectives and therefore it's easier for them to, to get their nominees through? Uh, yeah, I think that the, all of those are part of it. I think another aspect of it is, and you can kind of see this in the court right now, there's not as as wide a range of um, of judicial philosophy amongst the justices on the left. Uh, I think one one potential reasoning for that is some of the liberal approaches to the Constitution, to legal interpretation, often almost import your political views. If you think the Constitution is evolving in the direction that society should be going, um, then the, ju the judge, when they're kind of trying to figure out which way is it evolving, they never think it evolves against where they think things should go. Right. <laughs> you know, right. They always right. think it's evolving in the, in the view, in direction they view as progress. So in that sense, a, your political views are really just a proxy for what you're going to come up with in a liberal, uh, in, in the outcome of the legal case. And when you look at the layout of how justices vote in the court, the conservatives, are all kind of often divided and have slightly, even if when they get to the same result, they often have slightly different approaches for how they get there and what the legal rationale is. The liberals much more often vote completely in lockstep and mm -hmm. uh, particularly on the major issues. They're not they're not picky detail about like, and, I, and, and I'm not against the picky details about, I think you need to make sure you're coming up with it for the right legal reasons, absolutely. I think that's the right way to look at it. But it, it, it looks to me like, it, they're more often on the left are just, hey, we're getting there. This is this any 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 stick will do to beat a mule, as I think uh, <laughs> Justice Thomas has probably said at times. So that is is a frustrating pattern that means that they tend to vote together more consistently. And also, you know, I, it, it sounds it sounds kind of cynical, but I, it seems to me that their approach to the law, um, it, it makes it just much easier to get where you want to go politically. And I'm not sure they even are consciously doing that, but I think when you have that approach, uh, these kind of open-ended approaches, rather than being actually trained on what the text and what the original meaning is, 
it opens the door to just it being another venue for politics. And uh, in that case, all you have to do is hire someone who's liberal and you're going to get the right, sure. you know, the right liberal results in the court. No, that, that explanation makes a lot of sense to me. It sounds uh, very logical why that might be happening. So I have another question here that's come in, and this is uh, very, very specific and uh, concrete to our current events. It says that President Trump gets another SCOTUS pick. Who might you think be most likely to be nominated? Well, as I said, he, yeah, he's working on a list right now. He has said he's going to update his list. That makes sense. Some of the people on the list probably are have aged out of the the uh, you know ideal range. And we have all these great up and coming new judges who now have a record that you can look at and evaluate. Um, I mentioned Kyle Duncan. I think he's a real rising star. Uh, there are several others on the courts. I mean, Amy Coney Barrett, who got a, a, a hard look last time. Amul Thapar is another one that was interviewed both for the Gorsuch and the Kavanaugh seat. He was a district judge before. And everyone was surprised when he was put on the uh, the Supreme Court shortlist. Who's this random district judge from Kentucky? Now that we've had a chance, he, the, the President Trump put him on the on the appellate court, um, and he sits on the on the Sixth Circuit now. We now that we've seen him on that court, it's like, oh wow, I see why he was in the shortlist because he's been a real leader there as well. Um, and uh, you see people like uh, Andy Oldham is another Fifth Circuit. Uh, nominee Lisa Branch in the 11th Circuit, Lawrence Van Dyke in the 9th Circuit. There's a lot of really great people, and that's that's not an exhaustive list by any means. So uh, Mike Lee, even who's the one the one non-judge that was on this list, because he has been so clear in his uh, perspectives on the court. So it's it you know I think there's a lot of different uh, options, and it's really an embarrassment of riches right now uh, for the president because there's there are so many great judges, and I, I think they're it's just exciting as I'm at this point reading through some of their uh, resumes, some of their, uh, their top decisions that, that each one has made. And you're going, this is, this is a great future that we have and a great uh, bench to choose for the next bench. Right. That's, that's really encouraging and uh, great to have a no number of people in the bullpen, so to speak. I, you know, I'm wondering uh, at Acton, we talk about the importance of the role of subsidiarity and the rule of law. And I've reflected a little bit on, on the high stakes nature of the Supreme Court nomination process and all that it can go either way. The, is, is the high stakes nature somehow reflective of American society's failure to sort of embrace subsidiarity and, and everything gets decided at the very top and then the stakes become so high for the entire nation? Uh, any thoughts on that? On uh... Yeah, I think, I think that's a real part of it. I mean, there's there's different things that drive the, the increasing role of the Supreme Court. We talked about if they're acting like judges, I think I gave the quote from Justice Scalia, if you're acting like a, a politician and you're gonna get treated like politicians. But Perfect. the Supreme Court also has a disproportionately large role in American life than it did historically. I mean, at the time of the founding, it was not, part of the reason it was the courts were thought to be the least dangerous branch is because they, they didn't have the same range of, of things they were involved in. Part of it is because they actually were much more limited to what the constitution itself explicitly says. Uh, you know, when you, when you have judges who are willing to read in rights into the constitution, every time they do that, they create a whole new chapter in a constitutional law book that judges then get to just kind of fill. And if you're, and if you're reading in new rights, basically out of thin air, then it's it's a really a blank slate that judges are writing sure. on. That's a huge right. area that gets grown. But also as the federal government grows, and here's where the subsidiarity part comes in, if the if the federal government is growing beyond its constitutional bounds and beyond just the bounds of what a, a good balance would be, um, then proportionately the Supreme Court grows. So really some of these questions should be being decided by the state Supreme Courts, uh, right. but, they're, but they're not. They're being decided at the federal level because the, the scope of federal law is so much larger than it ever was before. So all of those combine together to make this a hugely political topic. From my perspective, I think we could get the politics out of the court, even you know, without having to shrink the federal government, which would be is, is a harder harder task to do. But if the if judges really did feel themselves limited, uh, but to, to the text and the original meaning, uh, that that doesn't mean that doesn't have to be a judge from one political party or another. That that idea of sticking with the text and the and the original meaning is something that, that is politically itself neutral. But it would take the judges out of this deciding process. And if they were really if they were really all doing this, it wouldn't it shouldn't matter to us. What does this judge think about guns? What does this judge think about abortion? What does this judge think about religious liberty? I sh I shouldn't have to ask that question. I should have to ask what do they think about text and how to interpret it. And, and that I think would take 
the politics out of these questions and put all of those back on Congress, which is happy to avoid the responsibility of having to be accountable for the votes they take, accountable for the laws they choose to write, choose not to, not to write. Um, and I think uh, that would that would do go a long way towards starting to fix the the imbalance that has grown up in our constitutional system. No, I can see that, especially Congress, uh, you know, deciding to kind of shed their responsibility and hand it over to the courts in so many cases that, yeah, that it would be wonderful if judges would approach it that way and it would lower the stakes and be better for everybody, it seems, in my in, in my estimation. So thanks for that. I'm going to I'm going to go back to some of our questions from um, online. So so when it comes to the nominees and just the gauntlet they have to go through, and especially the, you know, the, the recent Kavanaugh nom nomination process. You, know, you mentioned at the very end of your book that really it's up to the American people to decide how this is going to play out in the future. That it, you know, on the one hand, you've got this fabulous book that ends up providing the accurate history so that people don't continue to fashion a narrative where people are going to look and have an asterisk on uh, Justice Kavanaugh's name. Uh, mm -hmm. But at the same time, what can people do, practically speaking, to help protect any justice from having to go such an insanely political uh, process? Yeah, I think one thing is by knowing our history, we can hold people accountable to for what they have said and done before. Um, I, I, I wish there had been more criminal charges actually brought against the people who who submitted false claims and some some of them even admitted their claims were false so that they I just made this story up if if people think that's actually there's no downsides to this then we can just expect that to happen twice as right. much next time right yeah. so holding people accountable and to the extent that you know you can put pressure on your elected representatives to do that i think that's important i think uh you know if all of us I, I, we obviously you know voting for the elections have consequences voting for the president has consequences but we have to remember voting for senators also has consequences so consider how did your senator comport him or herself during this process uh were they were they actually taking this um this process seriously were they jumping on a smeared bandwagon you know i i think if it, to some extent that happened in 2018. And some people like Claire McCaskill said she specifically thought she lost her seat in Missouri because of the Kavanaugh confirmation. She ended up voting against him. And I think we need to, we need to make sure that people are holding their representatives accountable for when they, when they are not, uh, when they're turning these processes into more of a politicized event than actually a, um, a real serious consideration of the sure. issue. Uh, and I think we have to all then go into the next nomination process aware of what may happen. I think we have to be careful not to be, obviously, to take potential allegations seriously, but not to be credulous, not to not to jump to conclusions. And to, and I think anytime we practice being willing to stand up ourselves, as we were talking about earlier, I think that that helps fight a um, a culture that that is is uh, I think becoming very negative in terms of uh, a lack of mercy, a lack of being willing to uh, understand that there are different points of view and being willing to have you know reasoned debate on those. Because changing that culture for the better, helping people to understand how to have a reasonable discussion and differ on an issue and not go away hating each other, is what will help us be able to the next time something like this happens, actually have those, I think, debates like Collins was able to have, the discussions, rather right. than just saying, well, you're in the you're in the Blasey Ford camp, I hate you. You're in the Kavanaugh camp, I hate you. And that was almost the level of public discourse. So I think everything we can do to help restore a culture of being able to have civic discourse will go toward improving the next Supreme Court nomination, and frankly, the next everything that we yes. go through together as a country. Yes, no doubt. I think the Supreme Court nomination process does reflect some broader phenomena that are occurring in our culture as a whole, the cancel culture. And like you say, you polarize individuals and categorize them and don't even have a reasonable discussion. And in fact, I, I didn't realize, but people do respond to incentives. Like you, like you said, if there's no consequences for admitting filing false accusations against a, nom a nominee, you're sending a signal to others who might be incentivized to say, well, there's, like you say, no downside if I laud, you know, launch a, a false accusation. So, wow, um, didn't think about that. Thanks for that answer. Let me let me run back here to a couple of other uh, questions. Um, so it looks like somebody says, how do you think the handling of the Merrick Garland nomination 
has impacted the current nominating and confirmation process. And just to remind folks, this is the individual nominated by President Obama, which then never got through a confirmation process. Right. Right. So Merrick Garland was the nominee to replace Justice Scalia, who died in February of 2016. Uh, you know, that's something that a lot on the left have used as kind of a rallying cry and an excuse to say, well, because Garland, anything goes. And um, I have to say, I think that is a little disingenuous when you consider the fact that, you know, when you look at the Bork nomination, when you look at the Thomas nomination, I think a lot of them will say, well, this is our excuse. We no longer have to treat anyone with civility. I would say first, they weren't treating anyone with civility before that. They were the, this, this, the attacks that were on not just those high profile ones, but even people like Justice Alito, his wife uh, had to leave the confirmation process in tears for the, the, after some of the attacks that had been made on her own husband. And he's not even one we remember as having been attacked, uh, but, but he was, even his own, even his claim of Italian heritage was like, oh, you're not really Italian. What? <laughs> you know, they had to dig up his father's uh, birth certificate to show that he wasn't lying about being Italian. I mean, it's, it's, it's ludicrous. Um, so, so, but I do think it's something that the left has said, well, this is now our excuse for saying anything goes. This is, it's a, it's a same pattern we've seen in many ways in, uh, in civil society in a post-Trump world. A lot of people have said, well, Trump, you know, he's sui generis. Now we don't have to follow any of the rules of civil discourse anymore. And so the, 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 the shreds of, of civility that were left, whether it's in the news media, whether it's in just public discussion, are then thrown out. I don't think we can- I don't think we can take that as an ex as an excuse. It's not fair, and it's really part of this whole process of I disagree with you on an issue, and so now I it's if you if you make the other person sort of the the other, I don't have to take your argument seriously. That's uh, you know th that's going to have a real negative impact on right. our on our group. I think there were people who were frustrated that that his his uh, seat wasn't filled, but to my 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 response to that is, and I talked a little about this before. Elections have consequences, right? There's two types of elections but constitutionally that are relevant to a Supreme Court vacancy. One of them is the president. The president gets to nominate, but the other one is the Senate and the Senate has to confirm, right? They, they have that role in the process. It, it, if you look through American history, when there has been a vacancy that came up during a, a, a election year and the House or the Senate was held by one party and the, and the uh, White House was in the hands of the other party, it almost never, they've almost never been confirmed. That's just not not surprising, right? If you see them held by the same party, they're almost always confirmed. So it's like two thirds of them are confirmed if they are, if it's if they're both in the hands of the same party, if it's United Government, not surprising. And in, in, in an election year, and in an election year, two thirds of them are not confirmed. And frankly, most of the time, not even brought up for a vote if they're in different hands. So what we and saw was, was an unsurprising consequence of the way that the constitution sets this up. The American people, when they gave the, the Senate to Republicans in 2014, were exerting a check on President Obama. They were saying, wait, you know, wait a minute, the direction the government's going isn't where we want to go. Now, now you guys have to work together to get anything done. Practically speaking, we know that doesn't, that means they often don't get anything done, but at least they don't move anything in one direction or the other. And the but same thing happened with the Garland nomination. So it actually worked. I mean, it was a check on, on, yeah, on the process. They were, they were and that's, yeah, yes. I think I think well, that's that's what the what the effect is of our constitutional system. It, they, it slows things down, and uh, and it means that okay, we're in a holding pattern. And then when the American people give both parties the same, uh, bo both houses the same party, or both the, the the Senate and the White House, you're going to think see things move in, it, f faster in one direction or the other. Uh, I think we'll see that we'll see in in November what they do. You know, if 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 the Democrats win both the Senate and the White House, we're going to see a dramatic shift in the direction the courts are going, in the direction the Supreme Court and all the lower courts are going. If it's divided government, we're gonna see things slow down, maybe some compromise positions that get come to, but not moving as quickly at all. And uh, and, and vice versa, if it's the Senate in, in, in Republican hands and the White House as well. So this is this is how that elective process plays out in the courts. Well, that's very helpful. And you know, it's interesting, it is of course the election coming up this year and, and lots of consequences. I would love to continue to have the conversation, but unfortunately we are out of time. But I, your, your book and your lecture, so much. thank you so much for, for joining us. And uh, again, Justice on Trial, co-authored with uh, Molly Hemingway. Thank you so much for joining us, Carrie. And uh, thank you all to the, to the whole audience for joining us as well. Thanks.